Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Ternium stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Ternium is a manufacturer of steel products with production centers in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia and the US. The company is headquartered in Luxembourg and was founded in 2005. It went public in 2006 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Mexican Bolsa, and Deutsche Börse. It is the leading steel company in Latin America with highly integrated processes to manufacture steel and value-added products. The company has an annual production capacity of 12.4 million tons of steel and iron ore. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 7.9 billion market cap, they're trading at $40 a share, and they have 196 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have pretty consistent free cash flow, 1.2 billion a year, although it does drop in 2018 at 600 million. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement, and that's pretty steady from 1.5 billion to 1.4 billion, but it does dip a lot in 2018 and comes up a little bit in 2019. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that was 11.5 billion in 2017 decreasing to 9.7 billion in a trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. They had their highest gross profit in 2018 at 3 billion, but it's currently 2.4 billion in a trailing 12 months, which is a lot higher than 2019 and their revenue in a trailing 12 months was lower than 2019. So it seems like they're becoming more efficient. Below that is operating expenses. Examples are marketing and depreciation. Then below that is operating income. And that was the highest in 2018, lowest in 2019. It's currently 1.8 billion. The price of steel has a major effect on this company's revenue and profits. They paid $37 million of interest on their debt. That was the lowest they paid in the past four years. They paid over $130 million in 2018. Then below that is other income and expenses. They had negative $174 million in 2018. The main reason for that negative was a $276 million loss on the sale of a security. In 2019, they had a $148 million loss on the sale of a security. In the trailing 12 months, they had a $100 million loss but they had a $98 million gain on equity interest. This is a gain on its investment in other companies. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was the highest in 2019, but it's not much lower in a trailing 12 months. They had low net income in 2019 and 2020 because they had low operating income. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. You can see their operating cash flow is pretty consistent year to year around 1.7 billion. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant and equipment. They spent over $1 billion in 2019 in CapEx. That's why they had low free cash flow that year. The free cash flow in the other years is around 1.2 billion. They pay $400 million a year in dividend payments. So after they paid $400 million, they still had $800 million left over in the trailing 12 months. It looks like they used most of that money to pay down debt. They paid over $700 million of debt that year. In 2018, they paid down over $1 billion of debt. In 2020, they paid down about half a billion. You can see in 2019, they had low free cash flow, so they issued more debt than they paid down. Let's look at the capital structure. 7.8 billion of equity, 2 billion of debt. They're 80% equity, 20% debt. Their net debt is 514 million, and their WAC is 7.57%, and that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. 
We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 12 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $11.7 billion. We divide that by 196 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of $60. They're trading at $40, so they're trading at a 32% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. You can see my future free cash flow estimate was lower than past years, except in 2018. It's higher than that. The reason my future free cash flows are lower is because my model looks at the change in revenue over the years. Since their revenue has gone down from 2017, that negatively affected the future free cash flow growth. Simply Wall Street values them at $85 a share, so they're saying they're 53% undervalued. The top chart is a stock price since it IPO'd. It looks like a roller coaster. It peaked at about $50 back in 2007 or 8. Then the stock really crashed and it came way back up, then back down again, up, then down. Now it's trading pretty close to its all time high. You can see the stock price in the last year, so wherever you bought it, you could have made a nice profit. They pay an annual dividend. They seem to raise their dividend pretty much every year, from 50 cents up to $2.10. They pay a really good dividend, 5.21% dividend yield. To calculate the dividend yield, you could just take their last dividend payment and divide by the stock price. They pay out 30% of their net income and 34% of their free cash flow. Their industry pays a 2.2% dividend, so they're much higher than their industry. And analysts are forecasting their dividend to decrease to 5.1% in the next three years. Three analysts priced this stock and the average price was 43, the low was 40, the high was 44. They have a beta of 1.36, so the stock moves a little more than a market. The stock has done really well the past 52 weeks, up 190% while the S&P 500 is up 42%. The 52-week low was 14, the high was 42. And the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 196 million shares outstanding, only 49 million are on float, so it has a low float percentage. 21% are held by institutions, and less than one quarter of 1% of the shares are shorted. In the past year, this stock has gone up 227%, while its industry went up 105% and the market 53%. But in the past three years, this stock has only gone up 12%, its industry 61%, and the market 62%. Although in the past five years, this stock has gone up 158%, its industry 157 and the market 126 Analysts are forecasting their earnings to decrease 22%, its industry to decrease 4% and the market to increase 15%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to decrease 2%, its industry to increase one half of 1% and the market to increase 9%. In the past five years, their annual earnings increased 9.5%, its industry 19% and the market 12%. In the past year, their earnings increased 317%, its industry 37% and the market 19%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd be at $18,600 today. That's an 86% return, a 6.4% annual return. The reason they have a low float is because 75% of the stock is owned by Roca and Partners. Paolo Roca is an Argentine Italian businessman who owns most of this company and other companies in this space. Their second biggest shareholder is Lazard Asset Management, then Schroeder, 91 UK, and another division of Schroeder. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33, the median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 5.7, so investors are paying $5.70 for $1 of earnings. They have a really good price of sales also at 0.8. A good price to book at 1.0. They have 890 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Their return on invested capital is 18.8%. Interest coverage ratio 49. ROE is 17.8. They have a high current ratio at 2.4. Their current assets are 1.5 billion of cash, 1.7 billion of receivables, and 2.4 billion of inventory. So they do seem to be well capitalized. They had 1.2 billion of free cash flow. 3.2 billion of working capital and a 412 million dollar dividend payment so they have 4 billion dollars of funding 
The best way to look at ratios to compare with them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of three other companies in the same industry as Ternium. And if Ternium has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're a little worse in PE. They're doing much better in price to sales, price to book, and current ratio. Their ROE is lower than average. They're doing better in debt. They're the biggest company on this list. And they pay the second highest dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 32% discount. This is a pretty big company in the steel industry, but you have to remember when you invest in a commodity business, a lot of the profits are dependent on the price of that commodity. So if the price of steel is really high, this company will be really profitable. If the price of steel is low, this company may struggle. But steel will always be around. You don't have to worry about that. So for a long-term play, I think it's okay. Plus for the people who bought this stock a year ago, the stock price has doubled, plus they're getting that sweet dividend payment. So they're really happy. Even if the stock price is flat, you're still getting your 5% dividend yield. I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 6 out of 10, and their ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.